Um, I would start saying a bunch of things, but I want to wait for Francis. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how's it going? I know it's long and it's it's slow. <laughs> I was, I, I was like, oh God, I better make an action movie next. Um, let's see, I think Mike Stoltz is here. Are you still here, Mike? Mike Stoltz did some camera work on it. Um, there's some local people who worked on it, Ignacio Gensen, um, Kiara Govindo, um, and it was shot in Kansas City, Missouri um, during a hot, hot summer, and um, I'm just making small talk until <laughs> Francis comes. Um, let's see, what else? Well, I don't even know if we're gonna do a Q&A, so if anyone has a question until Francis comes, does anyone have a question? You can just yell it out. Okay, you could. All right, we could just meditate together. <laughs> Oh, that's a nice question. Um, no, it didn't start with the title. Was that your question? Um, no. Uh, it started, um, the title came sort of midway through the process. Um, I was thinking a lot about, I was thinking a lot about agency and where do we have it and where do we not have it and our ability to have an effect and to be affective and um, uh, I was reading this article by the philosopher Brian Masumi called Navigating Moments and he talks about um, how we are simultaneously being affected and having an affect every time we make a choice or, or you know bust a move and um, and how that's this cyclical thing and, and that can generate power, build power, dissipate power cyclically. And then that made me think about this Rumi poem that I remembered from when I was young um, where Rumi talks about um, how people are, kind of, here's Francis. <laughs> Yay! Um, well, I'll just finish up this thought about Rumi, where Rumi talks about um, a threshold between the two worlds, like the world of the living and the dead, the world between the conscious and the unconscious, and he says people are crossing over this threshold, the door is round and open, don't go back to sleep. And so I was thinking about those two things kind of converging, how maybe there's this threshold that we're trying to cross over and take a step over and beyond, and then I was also thinking a lot about how we're going to need to connect with some other world because we need help. <laughs> and um, I liked that idea about the door is round and open, don't go back to sleep, like stay up. Oh, because he says it, um, the door is round and open at dawn, so he's talking about staying up all night, don't go back to sleep. So, you know, a kind of like resilience and maybe struggle to get there. Okay, I was just blowing time. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Okay, hi. 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 Um, sorry about that. Do you wanna, I just went handheld. Okay. If, are you, are you there? Okay, wow. I didn't wanna leave at the end to go to the back. <laughs> so that's why took me so long. Um, the first time I saw this film, I could not shut up after. <laughs> and um, I felt like I wanted to have like a hundred different conversations about it. And so I don't really have a plan tonight, but I just thought I would go through and some little touch points. Um, because one of the broad, I mean, maybe I'll try to talk about the broader sort of thing that I took away from the film. But because we have you here, it'd be great to get into some of the details about decisions and stuff. So, um, but one of the things that I was sort of piecing together the second time around was an understanding of the different places. Because in my mind, they all exist in the same building or something. 
Yeah, I know, because I was feeding back, right? Um, it's actually four different... Why? What should we do? Should we move the speaker? Can you guys hear that? We're feeding back. Um, it's actually four different locations, right. but it's also psychologically right. one space. Right. So, yeah. Because the thing, one of the things that is so striking is the fact that that there's a kind of work ethic for these kind of caretaking characters. <laughs> And, and the first thing that kind of struck me about it was there's a certain kind of caretaker class, which felt to me not so dissimilar from a creative class <laughs> or art workers or something. Well, there was this kind of incredible intimacy and camaraderie about anyone who sits together to make a movie or to make an art show happen or whatever. So there was like this incredibly um, palpable sense of a shared ethic amongst these kind of people that may have been kind of just haphazardly strewn together. And so I held that, so I've always walked around with the memory of this film as feel like that that was like the first time I felt like a kind of professional, like that there was, there was like a, you had so well articulated a kind of professional anxiety or something about being in a kind of c c um, crisis, kind of perpetual triage situation. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the group, because that comes in so sort of forcefully in the end when you are then the alone filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. and. Um, that was, well, I'll talk about that separately, um, that decision to do that, to talk to the people. But um, I guess in some ways, like in the bigger picture, well, like you're talking about um, like making work, being right. makers, mm -hmm. um, and in the core of that lies this desire to talk to the people, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk to the people. And so with this project, um, it's funny, the feedback is, it's like a little whale song. <laughs> it's like a, <laughs> a soothing It's like, like. a so, ooh. Um, <laughs> this project in, in particular, going into it, one of, I mean, one of the ways that I work is that I don't know a lot about the thing before I go into it. And one of the things that I knew about this was that I was gonna go indoors and try to deal with um, shelters and structures and spaces, but also that I wanted to see, I guess this is allegorical, you know, to see could I build a narrative with a group of people that I didn't know you and, and that their agency would be directly involved in creating the narrative itself and even the language and the words would come from their bodies and their stories and that I wouldn't be the sole auteur mm -hmm. in that situation and it, it wasn't a collaboration per se because I was the director and the you know sort of directing scenarios but I I wanted to see if I could do um, yeah to to build story which is what we're like we're doing as makers, what we're doing as people, what we're trying, how we cope, well, how we're trying to manage as right citizens is to keep remaking story and remaking it and hearing it and reworking it. And um, so I wanted to have an experience where that was like happening live, right. which was really terrifying. And I totally had a nervous breakdown in the middle of it and was just like, <laughs> You know. But it looks like it's sort of a like it feels it's so under control or whatever. But the the the, the it doesn't look like you. <laughs> but but what I but the but it becomes about these kind of the stories that are sort of leaking out of the because everyone it, there's an element of like Todd Haynes safe mm -hmm. to this. Where, Thank you, God, <laughs> which is one of my favorite yeah. films in the sense of it, it kind of creating a, like the horror of the everyday to like toxicity of everyday life so that's kind of like a given in yeah. this situation right. um, um, I just lost my that's okay I'm sorry that's okay I'm gonna move closer because I feel like I'm far away <laughs> I know. Wait, you need one of these with milk in it 
Oh, yeah. Does anyone want to know about the milk? Well, yeah, I do. <laughs> I, the, yeah. Well, can, we can, yeah, we can talk briefly like about bit. the milk and see what the, else that brings no, up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> can you well, say about, uh, b yeah, can you yeah, talk about Yeah, yeah. Well, the milk, um, a lot of the, sometimes when there's a detail in this piece, um, the detail uh, was, the details are kind of gleaned from a variety of different places, um, and the milk was during that year that I was writing it and trying to figure out and make this film, um, you know, I was really keyed into all of the uprisings that were going on all over the world and everywhere that, and I, you know, following activists streaming online from Tahrir Square and then Brazil and Istanbul, and it was, it, it was nonstop where, um, the state and uh, militarized police forces were, you know, um, really coming down super heavy on the people and tear gassing was happening everywhere and milk is a salve for tear gas and so I was just really hooked into this whole, um, you know, uh, sense of the agency ebbing away, right, and the encroachment of the state into right our very body space and our ability to even see or breathe and so that kind of toxicity and so the milk I just thought well everyone should have milk in this film because that's what's coming so there's sort of like it's not necessarily ever supposed to be read literally right, that way exactly. but it's a symbolic you know here's this thing and that was sort of one of the few directions that I would give people is just say why don't you guys go into the kitchen and start filling bottles of milk because you're gonna need it because the cops are coming and you're not safe. And so that was sort of like part of the anxiety I would just sort of set up for us continually is like, what if they're coming and nobody else is left and it's just us and them? Well, that, well that, go back to what, what I had lost my train okay. of thought earlier about the stories, but it feels like there are these like, you know, like stringing, you know, pulling the story, the woman in the bathtub, you know, like you're getting these kind of little narratives or the, the why is the old guy like afraid of spilled milk or what so like they're in this host they're in like a kind of safe type situation where their whole outside you don't know if it's post-apocalyptic or it's the road or you right. know like it has that kind of feeling but but they're just like like I don't know like leaking out their humanity or something in these little ways and it's so <laughs> kind of profoundly um I don't know, encouraging, I guess. Mm. <laughs> um, but I want to just go through some of the details because okay. I, there is, there's something so familiar about the kind of, the camaraderie being a kind of soothing thing and it being a kind of weird haphazardness of what the support network is. And, and then, of course, the sort of AT&T logo is outside every time they're like, oh, what the, blah, 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 blah. And, every, and so there's a certain independent contractor ethic where it's like, oh, we all have to pay for our own phones in this emergency, or you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever job you are, whatever, everyone's an independent contractor and they're all trying to save each other's ass, whatever. That's like the kind of, so they yeah. could be Occupy or they could be <laughs> right. an arc out, whatever. <laughs> but um, um, I want to ask about the, the guy with the deer, um, mm -hmm. Or just like go, yeah. starting with him and maybe a few sort of sim mm -hmm. things that were sort of offered very carefully as symbolic or um, yeah. meaningful um, icons. Well, yeah. Well, again, that um, one of the things that you should know is that everyone who was in it except for one or two of the people, I didn't meet them until they showed up on set that day. So there was this other layer of kind of like having to sort of like divine the personalities and just be like, okay, you and you should talk and you will die. And, but those were, their directions were general or sometimes I'd put them in specific scenarios, but with each person and a lot of the process that happened in the film, of course, you don't see. And I edited a ton out, you know, like, it's probably 20 hours of footage down to, you know, one hour. So um, some of the, what I did with everybody was I asked them um, to, tell, to tell us on set something that they were an expert at 
where was their expertise, what was something that they know about or they're really interested in, so that the place they'd be generating material from was something that they knew and cared about and could bring to the table. And he was like, I know a lot about animal symbolism. And I was like, great. And every now and then I would just ask him to give us another one. <laughs> <laughs> so then he got the hat after that then? No, he picked the hat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I gl and that was the other, I mean, there's all these sort of ritualistic bits of things that really just occurred spontaneously. I wasn't specifically thinking, I'm going to cast a community spell. But I did get all of these. Um, I found this woman who makes scrub caps. And she was like, you can pick any fabric you want. She had all these fabrics I could select from. So I picked a bunch of different kinds of fabric. And then when the cast would come to set, they could just, I'd lay them all out and they could just pick theirs. And I'd be like, that's going to be your hat for the whole film. <laughs> so everybody, you know, the one girl picked the beer mugs. And the and, yeah, and the LOL, OMG. And yeah, there was, so he picked that hat. But um, so, I mean, I know and that sounds like, maybe that sounds disappointing, like, ah, oh, it was random. But what I was trying to do with getting people to generate their material was then, you know, like recording hours and hours and hours and hours. And then I would start to hear what the story was and start to hear what the poetics were and then carve it out of all that raw material and start to put it together. But what is the time frame of that carving? Well, the carving, the editing took, like I sh it was shot in prob probably like maybe 10 days total, but the editing took like six months. You know, four, and were the four 10 months. days that everyone was very... No, we were not to get, you mean together? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's what the thing, actually um, there was only, you know, the, the talkative information guy, he, he was there through the duration of all the shoots because really he showed up to be the PA. And the first night of shooting, we went out drinking and he was like, God, da -da -ba 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 -da -ba -ba -da -ba with the information. And I was like, oh, I do that too. Why do you have all that information? <laughs> And he said that he had insomnia and he would stay up and wiki all night long. And I was like, oh, would you be in the film? Because he was just the guy who bring the oh, okay. sodas and the water and whatever. So then he ended up, anyway, so he was, most people just showed up um, only one day. I didn't get to know anybody. Wow. No, it was really trippy. It was like really, and I kind of wanted it that, it was just like, there are gonna be these people who show up to this house on this day, we're gonna shoot for 12 hours, we're gonna go through all these experiences, and then they were gone and I never saw them again until you know, like the film showed there. And so it was really sort of, we're gonna go deep and fast, and people had to pull material quickly. Like Jose and, um, um, oh my God, why am I spacing out her name? Because I, thank you, oh. Well, hi. Yes. Um, the, the people in the kitchen talking about spilling the milk. Um, that was at like 6 in the morning. Like at 5 a.m. we got up to get this sunset shot, and first we shot in the pool. And they didn't know each other, and they had never met. And I just said, why don't you guys now fill these milk containers? And they just started talking. And he offered the information about this phobia about milk. And then she was like, yeah, my mom put me in the bathtub and poured it all over me when I spilled it. And yeah, anyway, so... We, and then we, you know, we shot all day long and then split apart and went away. So there was not a, an um, enduring sort of group uh, getting to know each other. Right. Is that your question? <laughs> that was a long answer. No, I mean, not, I'm just, I'm curious about the, but I was back at the deer. Oh yeah. Um, wait. Um, Okay, so then one. Okay, here's another one. Then so these. So this is then. I can't remember who's saying this. That they they were listing their jobs and they said assisted living. I worked in an assisted living place and then after that they said I worked at an, an advertising, advertising museum, museum right? <laughs> and I was just so convinced that was such a like planted juxtaposition. No, nope. because it's such a significant juxtaposition. <laughs> right. No, that I guess that's what I mean about this the editing process and the, my listening process. Right. I literally, her direction there was, look, she's dying, there's not a lot you can do to help her talk to her. And then I would give prompts, I would say, because of course, right, like 
for a year, I wrote and I wrote and I wrote, and then I call from that, what am I thinking about? What am I interested in? What am I keying in on? And then instead of trying to give those texts to people to perform, I would just sort of pull from my own sort of set of texts about various anxieties and things. And so, of course, labor and work is always one of them. I was like, tell her all the jobs you've had. And that was then I'd have someone else come in, tell them all the jobs you've had. You tell them all the jobs you've had. And so, uh, yeah, like, what's an advertising museum? Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, there is some, the, there's something about the kind of, I don't even, I keep thinking, like, caretaker class or something. I don't know, like, by sheer freak coincidence, serendipitousness, I had to go to the emergency room yeah. the other night. Right. In, in, I'm like in preparation for this. But it was literally, you know, like whatever, 20 different people in scrubs and you encounter and, and they're totally separate from each other and they're all doing a sort of similar thing. So there's, but, and then I also got my pants at the Dickies place that's all scrubs. So you think, I think all the time about the scrub. And when I first saw your film, it was the very last semester I was working at USC and I thought, I think I need to just only wear scrubs this semester. <laughs> but there's a sense of right. scrubs as a kind of like weird marker of like a certain type of worker who, and it's like, what do they really mean, scrubs? Well, it's partly, it's right, it's this thing about sterility and like that somehow, somehow the scrubs are gonna have less germs on them right. than your street clothes, because right. maybe you're bringing that other, which is symbolic as a worker, right? I mean, there's a way in which they are metaphorical and then there's a right. way that's also real, like, right what is it to have to um, leave all these parts of yourself out here to cover up, right? The street right. clothes and the self and the, the personhood right. has to um, change. And then also the thing of a uniform. Right. And there's things that I really like about uniforms in terms of not so much the way they reflect a particular kind of authority making a decision for you about your attire and, you know, um, what kind of, Thing you have to wear for this job, but the way that it can symbolically, you know, if I like displace it as an artist, go, oh, right, there's also this unifying thing, and it foregrounds the the importance of the group right. over the individual. Right, exactly. Yeah, and that to go, oh, but then and then but then they have voice, and we hear them talk, and we hear them speak, and so then, I guess I was thinking like, well, what if the voice replaces like how we signify with our outfits. <laughs> well, but the thing is like when they're all, they're yeah. sort of, when they are sort of leaking out their identities or whatever sort of in, initially or something where it's like the two guys are out on the porch and it's like, oh, well, I was at this place once where I was the only one who didn't believe or never saw a ghost, but I believe it. And then the other guy is like the expert on like, you know, right. Egyptology or whatever. Right. But, the, but, the, but the notion that somehow, um, the, the humanity or whatever of the kind of person behind the, the help, you know, the person who's going to dig in your guts or help you or when you're dying or this sort of these, these are this, this is a group that are somehow automatically compassionate. Right, that's right, what right. That's what are marked as yeah. like, com that's what right. I mean, there's a kind of ethos. I see what you mean. And it's like, okay. so I always yeah. identified it as, oh, this is how I live in the art world. I have, I, my idea of the art world is not like this market website or that, or this collector asshole or whatever. It's like these people who actually have an ethic and they really want to, they believe in each other and we can always kind of count on each other. Mm. Or so, you know, they're, they're, that's how I always sort of projected onto mm. that sort of unifying the right. uniform or something yeah. of, of, of the uh, kind of solidarity. And also yeah. knowing like they're the victims at the same time that they're the kind of caretaker. Or whatever. Right, right, which I guess w for me was, because, sorry, I, I would, yeah, the caretaker thing is what you were trying to talk about. And um, I, I absolutely, you know, partly what happened was I made this piece called It's Cool, I'm Good, where I was the person who is super fucked up and possibly dying or possibly recovering. And I had these nurses caretaking me. And um, I, I had all these kinds of thoughts about 
the process of making that piece and the narcissism of being the performer and then also the generosity of it and all of those things. And I thought, ah, the caretaker is the one who holds it and holds it and holds the story. It holds the story and holds a mirror up to you. And right, that's then I thought, well, what if, what if I switch the power somehow and it, I make a whole film that's only the caretakers? Mm -hmm. And this way, again, of thinking about, um, I mean, all of the sort of examples and comparisons you've mentioned are interesting and work too. I hadn't thought about that in terms of like being like as, as an artist, for example, or an art worker, but also the like the ex the expectation of a certain kind of benevolence. And then I also one of the things that I told them was, but you're an expert too, right? Because that's the other thing that that symbolizes. Right. Like I have a certain set of knowledge that could save your life. Right. <laughs> so I thought, well, what if we raise the stakes and just put put those factors mm -hmm. into precarity and um, see, well, what are the other um, dynamics that develop in and around the identity of being a caretaker and an expert? Because a lot of times they, they, there's also kind of this other type of melancholy or exhaustion that is present. But the, okay, so let's talk about the rat. <laughs> Is it a rat? So it's like a rat bear. Rat bear, because <laughs> that's like a little cameo moment. <laughs> and um, and then the rat is like the brick allure or something. He's like all like alone or oh, and they right. are discussing the tail. Right, which time. was again just totally like just happened. <laughs> but so like yeah, the rat. Can you talk about the rat? Yeah, I mean I guess. And again, I didn't really know exactly. The rat was actually, the rat bear was sort of the first thing I started shooting before this, before the rest of it sort of came to being. And, and then, and I was gonna abandon all of it. And I thought, why are you having like a cute, weird, half human running around your movie? You just cut it all out. This just... <laughs> and then it, I kept not cutting it out. And I thought, and then it, you know, um, a bunch of different people actually play the rat bear. Um, and really, I think that the rat bear is maybe holding, is the one who is closer to this threshold space that I was talking about between worlds. And um, it, it really is outside. And all of the land that happens in this is where there's wildness uh, um, in exact proximity to development. Mm -hmm. So there are these seams, these thresholds that are pressing against each other that are, that are at odds. And so the rat bear is just, con is basically in that space. Mm -hmm. um, it's, there's all these places where we'd find that they had built a cul-de-sac and then not then there were the housing crash, and so then the houses didn't get built. So there were just these cul-de-sacs with just like wildness and dead deer all around. Um, so the rat bear also like the rat bear dreams. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and <laughs> the rat bear has good dreams. Um, the rat bear dreams and like so the rat bear has some other kind of psychic uh, other mind space and. So, again, yeah, it was a little, I was like, God, can you get away with that? I don't know, can you have this? And I thought, yeah, because these aren't really nurses, so you can have someone that's just existing in the in-between. I guess because I'm trying to invoke the in-between because I'm really worried about where we're at. Right. And well, I'm that's <laughs> like, he's like the trickster or something. Yeah, I um. guess, yeah, I mean, or the, yeah, that because it, he's safe on both sides or something. I mean, I just associated it with you somehow, or the mm -hmm. artist or something. Yeah, so Malik said the same thing. He was like, oh, that's the artist, right? Is that the director? That, yeah, because I was the thinking artist? that, and I mm -hmm. think I somehow associate it with you on the, the moped or on the mm -hmm, little the bike. bikes or whatever. Oh, right, from the other, with yeah. The, yeah, with the yeah. hospital gown and the, yeah. something about the freedom of the, of the movement, too. Right, because the rat bear is the only one that has mobility. But he also seems like he was observing, or like you would get to the, like the beetle, for example, mm -hmm. which is early on, sort of like slow you down and pay attention to something that, that with his little wings like hanging out, yeah. looked all awkward. Yeah. So he was like, I don't think it was really him. Did he oh. find the 
beetle? No, it's one of the <laughs> nurses who's watching the beetle. Okay. But um, it's in that same spot where we see him later. But yeah, the animals are, they're all kind of related. Um, and then were there specific kind of um, the corn politics? <laughs> was, was there like a specific, did you have a lot of um, connection to being in that, in that city? Or I mean, were you, did you feel the, mid, the Midwest? Yeah, I hadn't, <laughs> what? I don't know, I just, it's such a no man's land to me. And I feel yeah. like it came so much across like that, but I was just wondering about a lot of the farm. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, the I ended up there because there was an arts organization there who was producing the film and I had, they were amazing and I had support and I never had that kind of support to make a thing. So um, I was telling them that I was looking, I had been shooting here in LA, um, uh, I, that sort of, I had started with, uh, okay, I'm gonna go indoors, I need uh, domestic interiors, and I don't have any money, and I don't really, uh, how, how am I gonna, what are these spaces gonna be? And then I was talking to a friend who was saying, oh, well, up in Eagle Rock on, on these hillsides, there are these big sort of McMansions that um, were almost finished and then left empty, and they've been empty for four years. So I started breaking into those and shooting inside of them. And oh, then- you were breaking in. Yeah, I was sneaking in and they, but so then I started sending, so I sent some of the footage so to this organization who had t contacted me like the year before, and then I finally wrote to them and I said, okay, I think I, I have a project. Do you guys still want to do something? They're like, yes, definitely. And I sent them things. And they said, well, what are these houses? I said, well, they were left empty during the housing crash and they have countertops and almost finished, but then left empty. Meanwhile, all these people are being foreclosed on and right. losing their homes and it was freaking me out. And they said, oh, we're really having that phenomenon here. This is going on all over the place. There's tons of unfinished developments. Do you want to come shoot here? We can probably get you access so that you're not getting like arrested. Because the neighbors in Eagle Rock yeah. were like, those are our abandoned buildings and we're going to call the police. And I was like, like you know, it's just property is so like, those are our not properties. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah. So I so I I didn't know a lot about Kansas City, and I didn't want to make it be about Kansas right. City because I was like, well, that would be weird because I'm not really right. keyed in on that, and right. that's not what I'm thinking about. But then I got there, and of course, so many of the people that I met, and people who were working on the film were from there, and had almost everyone has done time working in the cornfields, or at least the people that I met. Like it was just a thing. Everyone's like, oh yeah, I've worked corn, walked beans done this thing called roguing like she talks about that's where you're pulling the tassels out of the corn like so that you know I got thinking about corn production and you, you know the industry and how most of the corn doesn't go to feeding people and all those things but those were really like kind of subterranean backstory right, right. stuff that's not explicit and right. I wouldn't pretend to be like yes and this is also about that because no, it's I'd... not <laughs> okay can we talk about the tubular bells the what? It was like a little like a sampling of tubular bells from like oh, the Exorcist, yeah. right? Oh no, it's it's, it's Halloween. A, oh, is it Halloween? Yeah. Okay. I was somehow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was from okay, Halloween. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> Okay. And then the double bass drum with yeah. the double shower head. Yeah. Am I the only one like laughing hysterically for that? No, oh, good. I'm oh, sorry. I'm glad you're getting these details. No, I'm, I'm all over the... I have like a huge list of details, but that could get too tedious. What do you think was one of the biggest things that kind of hit you about this film that first time that you saw it and you were really... I. Th well, it was a lot of things. It was really this sort of like the that the fact that these people are thrown together. You, they are to kind of together in a space that's very alien, and it feels a little bit like uh, one, uh, like um, where you're living adjacent to someone else's good living or something. So it's like this is these are signs of good living, but they're not real. They're just sort of inhabiting as kind of we're going to clean up a mess or we're here to make a movie or, you know, like there's this kind of scraggler uh, vibe and, and that you, that it's like shit has gone so fucking wrong, 
but we just are doing what we can do. You know, there's this, that sense of it is, was totally overwhelming. And I think that the two black guys who are like having that really intense moment in the beginning, like somehow like this idea of, and then when, when all, after everyone, you know, a few people die or whatever, he, the one who hasn't seen a ghost, is the one who just loses it. And he's the one who really is like showing this sort of profoundly human grief. And, 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 and when everyone's like, you know, get on the scene, like sex machine, you know, like, the, and they're all like having like a deep talk, you know, and it's through the yeah. window. And just something yeah. about those, the energy of those two men who felt like they didn't know each other in that sense, but they were somehow trying to make sense of like how fucked up the world is and it was this moment of like is there a god or not because mm -hmm. this is fucked up and i yeah. fucking hope that something else is better than what we are yeah and it's like totally insane like that yeah. was very i think that the kind of um directness of that kind of like leisure not leisure but like break time contemplation or something it's like I'm working, I'm on a break, I'm gonna die probably really soon too, but let me, you know, there's just something about that pondering that I found completely moving and felt really like a picture of the moment. It like really, like really felt totally of the moment, so. Yeah, no, <laughs> thanks for, yeah, I, I feel that way too. In fact, I wrote tonight when I was watching it again with everybody, I think I wrote down like I underlined that moment where he says, you know, there's got to be um, something else. We're too stupid to be the only things in the galaxy. There's just got to be in the way that he. But that was yes, that was that whole that whole conversation. Then and also um, shooting their private. There's a few places. That's one of them. And then with the women in the field, where I specifically wanted to create these situations where, no, we don't have access to everybody's um, interchanges right. and that that's real too. But yes, their whole, that whole conversation that they had um, became definitely um, like, a, like a, a, an, a conceptual and emotional core of the, of it, of the film. Yeah, and me. I think also to see everyone kind of doing a kind of hodgepodge ceremony or whatever, like, we're gonna do it. Too. Yeah. Do we do it too? Yeah. Yeah. No, we do it because we've got to do something. You know. So there's a kind of like makeshift. Yeah. Uh, so it's like this kind of forming a new way of being together, but yeah. not really sure what the ceremony is. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think the whole thing is like that. Both. Both for me as the maker, because that's how I was. I was like, okay, I'm making a new thing. I don't know exactly how it goes, but that's because I'm going to try to open up my boss power to this other way of making story. But then also thinking the, there's, I guess, like the way that the rat bearer is like this other, that there maybe there's this other, other world space that we don't have language for yet and we don't know, but that and this might sound cheesy, but that we have to make it. We have to, we, we, the, and so, yeah, the kind of sort of sweet, like, vulnerability and earnestness and, like, for real of them trying to make new ceremonies for what do you do. And, and this, this sense of, like, okay, you're the experts, you're the caretakers, but what if the whole administration and infrastructure that holds that is gone or undermined and then the person because you know the scrub nurse is right it's not the, yeah. the, right and so it's like all right we the people then the people who know haven't usually been wielding all the power and making the decisions and now um get to be in positions of, to make decisions and and how that yeah, that's what yeah. I mean about the independent contractors, the yeah. adjunct. Yes. You know, that's what, I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that the whole thing has completely fallen away. Yeah. And it's like just a matter of time. Yeah, smash the state. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Um, Should we ask them like if they have any should, questions? Yeah. Does anyone else want to ask a yeah. Question about the sort of like isolated woman in Scrubs who felt she was like, I was so vulnerable, I really know 
That's, yeah, she was right? like, she, that was a Woody Allen moment. I know, her. right? <laughs> and what's really funny is that she is the only person who I knew, and she is, here comes our whale song. Um, she's, an, uh, she's also the only person who is an actress. She's like a Shakespearean actress. And um, I've, I met her when we both had new babies and had postpartum depression. Um, and, and we've been... <laughs> We've been friends ever since. And um, she, she moved to Missouri, and I called her up and was like, oh, we're going to be shooting there. Can you come? So she, um, I, I, it started to make sense to me. Again, so, so I only had her for a few hours. And I was like, okay, we're going to, yeah. I only had her there for a few hours. She was like, I've got to get back. She's a single mom now, right? Like we, and I was like, I will get you back. Um, and... Um, so I was asking her really pointed personal questions, real stuff about like, what's the hardest thing about single parenting for you? Like we were like crying and talking and crying and talking and I was shooting. And so, but I also gave her, you know, like throughout the film people have, I was like, I would like, here, you have lunch meat, you have milk, you have cake, you have alcohol. <laughs> stuff that's not gonna be entirely useful or nourishing do stuff with it. And then the other thing that I gave her, because she was there on the first day of shooting, is I gave her these weird little paper mache babies. <laughs> okay, this is, I'm diverging. But she made those little... No, she well, then she them. started bandaging them, and again, I didn't give her that. And I just gave her, pa she had paper towels and milk and condiments and things, and as she was talking, she started doing stuff and basically wrapping them and singing and putting them places. And so what I was going to say to answer your question was... It, um, uh, that was the first house we shot in, and I had her there for a few hours, and some of the stuff that I was initially supposed to be in this film, we started shooting, and it was going haywire, and it wasn't working out, and so I was like, okay, that's not happening. I'm gonna shoot this film, and I'm gonna be in it. So then all of a sudden, she was alone, because that whole day was supposed to be her and I together in these scenes, and then I realized I needed to shoot it and be out there looking through the camera and so she was then alone and then later in the editing that started to make sense to have someone because you know all of these spaces in some ways are just psychological spaces right like the group the, all of it because can just be sort of metaphorical and so I thought right that's the banging around in the head space she's that like she's a psychic interior um, uh, trying to parse out um, which traumas and which anxieties cause which neuroses and things like that. So, um, yeah, and then there's like a moment where there's like kind of a ghosty other person there with her, but it seems kind of ghosty. And so, yeah, she is that alone deep pit core that I even mentioned then at the end of the film, the kind of the existential place where I go like, Wait, but can we really connect? Right, and it seems to be running through anxiously because she starts bandaging those little card pieces of cardboard. Yeah, does that answer your? Thanks. Anybody else? Question. Okay. Should we? Yes, here we go. Oh, I can't see it's dark. Call it out.
Well, it, we do briefly, and that's a good point. Maybe it needs to be a longer moment. We do briefly see the rat bear entering that pool from behind, and then we cut to the POV. So, but, but, but it's um, no. I appreciate what you said about that being another liminal space because absolutely, right? It's the wildness of weather hitting the manufactured body of water, and yeah, the rat bear um, goes under and sort of is submerged. So that location not matching up with the others was partly just I thought, well, the rat bear is sort of allowed to um, like infiltrate anywhere. Because so, um, and it's one of the only other times that the rat bear kind of goes indoors is we see it going up an, an escalator in this like architectural circle thing. But um, yeah, I just gave myself a permission there to. <laughs> oh, thank you, thanks. Um. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He becomes the undertaker. So that's like another kind of interlocution role. Oh, so he's role. following up. On he's there. kind of following a little bit this trail, and maybe that the, again, like maybe I was just thinking loosely. That's this other threshold of like, if he's the undertaker, then that connects him to the other world and the spirit world. And again, thinking of, in my mind, I'm not really thinking literally about ghosts and spirits. I'm thinking about um, another possibility. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Should we just say good night? Or. It's dark. You have to just holler if you have a question. I'm looking. Okay. Okay. Are you good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to say anything? Oh, well, look. Oh. <laughs> okay, good. That's the that. liminal hand. <laughs> Well, um, no, I mean, I specific, I, yeah, I, mostly what they had was sugar and alcohol. They, and so, and they had processed sugar, right, and processed alcohol. So again, these substances that can, there it's like limited sustain, in their ability to sustain um, either the need for thirst, but also the way alcohol cr helps us cross another threshold <laughs> and like a release, uh, um, from work and labor and that place where we, you know, there's like an escape valve. And I was like, and, and again, I really sort of left it up to them when they were gonna go to the bottles. Obviously it wasn't, you know, I took the alcohol out so they weren't just totally getting wasted. But, um, you know, I would put out cake and alcohol at every location and just see when they would start combusting this out. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Francis. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Don. The boy is mine. The boy is mine.